Kyle Thompson. And I'm C. Derek Varn. And you're listening to General Intellect Unit. This time we are reading about John Boyd. Um, a thing we've been threatening to do since basically the beginning of the show. Um, we're going to be reading a chapter from a book. So the, the book is titled Science, Strategy and War, The Strategic Theory of John Boyd by Franz Osinga. And the chapter we're reading is chapter six, The Core Arguments, um, which is a big kind of condensed summary of what's going on with Boyd. But in this episode, we'll be reading the first half of that chapter because it's a kind of a monster. Um, so yeah, uh, Derek, what was your general impressions of all this stuff? I found it fascinating from a, from a person who's been interested in conflict theory and, and conflict systems for a long time. Um, but I also found it interesting how this could be employed. So the first thing I read was like, oh, this is about um, institutional flexibility, uh, revitalizing institutions, pushing to the edges, understanding the terrain and the map are separate, all, all that good stuff. But I could totally see how someone could use this to, say, neoliberalize the military and bring in a bunch of contractors and, you know, wage a war in Afghanistan where you don't even learn Pashto. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, Kyle, because uh, you, you kind of brought this to the table. Um, what's what's the what's the big thing here that we're we're paying attention to? Um, yeah, so I think there's a there's a few reasons why we might be interested in Boyd. Uh, uh, so I think, you know, he was very heavily influenced by cybernetics, by systems theory um, and also by, uh, Marxists, uh, especially Leninists. So, um, Lenin and Mao in particular. Um, now of course, uh, Boyd was not a, uh, Marxist, <laughs> uh, <laughs> to say the least. Um, but I think that, his use of cybernetics and systems theory to understand conflict really helps to uh, maybe complement beer uh, because it focuses so heavily on how the uh, social organism uh, interacts with its environment in order to survive. Um, so beer similarly has a really big influence on survival, but is, is much more, uh, focused on internal organization, uh, and, um, you know, obviously talks about the environment a lot, talks about being sensitive to the environment, but doesn't really talk about the sort of the, the types of actions that are needed to survive as much. Um, whereas Boyd being a military theorist, um, is is very interested in some dimensions of that. Uh, so I think they have a lot of overlap, but they're looking at this problem from two somewhat different perspectives. Yeah, I think so. I think that's definitely the case, right? Because like, um, I, th I think maybe it's it's also worth emphasizing, like Boyd's thing is all about conflict, right? And it's it's like you, if you're if you're organizing something along a kind of Berean lines, you probably Maybe you shouldn't take too much from Boyd because you might end up creating internal conflict. You know, it's the, the conflict orientation is um, complementary to the kind of internal coherence dimension of beer, uh, but don't get them mixed up. <laughs> is is what I'd advise uh, for people like trying to organize things. I'll just say uh, that there there are, there's it's interesting that in a way, as far as internal conflict goes. Uh, Beer is actually more sophisticated than Boyd is uh, because Beer takes all of this stuff about like mutually vetoing systems and, you know, all of that kind of thing from uh, human physiology um, and tries to integrate that into his theory. Whereas Boyd kind of assumes away a lot of that stuff uh, in a way that is a little bit less sophisticated, I'd say. I think this is uh, where the teleological orientation of theorists really matters. And I know, you know, Brigham, classical Aristotelian terminology is kind of lame, but I, I think it is important. It, you know, Beer is focused on eudaimonia and on relatively stable social systems that make ethical use of human beings. Um, Boyd 
is a Hobbesian, like almost all soldiers. Um, and, and I say that because in, in a real sense, if your focus is conflict between states, um, the, the, the Hobbesian calculus doesn't really apply to actual human beings, but it actually kind of does apply um, to, to states. But, you, you know, a military strategist is not going to be particularly interested in conflict within the state. That is not their prerogative. That's not their orientation. Um, so, I mean, in a way, this is just proof that, like, what you're designing for really matters. Um, and, and I think it's a good lesson to learn from contrasting Beer and Boyd. And I, but... You know, th there's also a way in which the internal external conflict thing, and uh, maybe this will come up on a, on a, when we actually discuss the, 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 the conflict patterns, but th that distinction actually is a little bit artificial. And I think beer might be more helpful about understanding that um, because states are artificial. I mean, in, in a real sense, states are real abstractions like they are. They are things that don't actually exist, but have massive apparatuses that, because we believe they exist, they actually do. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it's they're they're both imagined communities with real guns, um, and whereas when you deal with actual like immediate social systems, there's a lot more nuance and and, and uh, ways to generate conflict. I mean, to to generate and dissipate conflict um, that that someone like Beer is more interested in handling and making sure it doesn't spiral the system into collapse or into overcomplexity, um, which, which is also something that Boyd is worried about because Boyd is worried about like the focus on traditional attrition warfare leading to both, you know, to mammoth complexities that just get people killed for no reason. You know, uh, I guess there's a sort of angle in that where also um, because Boyd is coming from a military perspective, he can, assume as a ground truth that basically every there's inter, there's a high degree of internal coherence because everyone's been through the same training and everyone's getting paid um and that everyone's kind of on the same page and on the same team from the start um and so he doesn't need to think, think quite as much about um kind of internal dynamics in inside that kind of system you know i i i i i think he He's certainly aware of the importance of harmony, uh, quote unquote, like the, the, the term he uses is harmony to refer to uh, like esprit de corps and uh, a common uh, intellectual background, a common worldview uh, that will bring people together. Um, so he's aware of the, the, the problem of a lack of cohesion and how incredibly, uh, disruptive that can be to a, a conflict effort. Um, but I think he's like incredibly for someone who basically spent his whole adult life in the U S military is, much less attuned to uh, the realities of bureaucratic infighting than mm. beer is. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> when, you know, like mm -hmm. the U.S. military is like the largest uh, bureaucracy <laughs> in the world, and uh, Boyd certainly was no stranger to that kind of fighting. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting blind spot. I, I think it's almost... Uh, not to go Cerulean on us, but like it's almost because it's like the assumption that Boyd has to have is this myth of of internal cohesiveness for for his military vision to work, um, and and that we're just going to bracket that one element out because we can't deal with it in terms of external conflict. Um, and, and that would make sense in terms of military strategy, but it would be a terrible way to build a a military system and maybe that's why Boyd has been used the way he's been used because <laughs> I mean yes. I, as I mentioned off air I mean John Boyd in a way it becomes the theorist of Ashcroftification of the military which is using auxiliaries using contractors contracting out but without without realizing that 
not only are you dealing with this massive bureaucracy within the military, but now you're expanding it to sub bureaucracies that are going to be in competition for resources. So you've got like power, power to the edges, right? Which becomes just like the, the ultimate power to the edges is just like turn the whole thing into a fucking market and um, push it out into contractors and, and outsourcers. Right. I mean, and, you know, to, to, to speak humanities jargon uh, for a second, Boyd is picking up on the ribosomation of the military. Like if you like you have an overly centralized, overly, overly brittle uh, bureaucracy, then you need to make it more adaptive. Um, and I do think it's interesting that he studies Lenin and Mao because what he studies is what Lenin and Mao do, not actually what they say. Because, because what Lenin and Mao say is actually the whole Marxist tradition after the First International of encouraging everything to be set along the lines of the Prussian general staff and hyper-centralization and massive wars of attrition. That is, what, that is the language of the Vanguard Party. That is the language of um, the way that these were, these ideas were set up in the way that a lot of a lot of Marxists still think about efficiency. They, they still think about it in a very 19th century mode. And they talked about it that way. Both Lenin and Mao did. But that's not what they actually did. Like, and Boyd picks up on that. Like, you know, in a way it makes, in a way it makes this great irony where like, you know, one of the, the American military strategists is the person who learns the most from, from Lenin and Mao where all that, uh, that we have learned is slogans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's wild. <laughs> yeah, well, I I think it's I, I think he it's it's not that he completely dismisses the writings of Lenin and Mao or, or Marx for that matter, because uh, there there is definitely a way in which like the 18th Brumaire is a very Boydian text, and I think that it 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 does figure into his thinking, um, but uh, he kind of sorts through the bullshit, right? Because or he filters it according to his point of view, which is this very Hobbesian point of view. So, you know, he's reading them in a way that Marxists certainly would not. Um, so, like, because I do think there's stuff in Boyd that, like, you know, it comes out of, like, the, the Little Red Book, right? It, 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 it comes out of some of Lenin's political writings, but it's it's kind of like not the main theme uh, or the main presentation of either of their perspectives on how to organize. Um, it's, it's more like, oh, you know, like, you know, uh, the stuff that Mao took out of uh, Schwunze, like, like about morale and stuff like that. It, 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 you know, that kind of thing is important. Uh, and, and he grabs that as opposed to grabbing uh, like combat liberalism, right? I mean, it's 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 interesting that um, it's another thing you can learn from applying these theories to the way Mao actually operated conflict, though, because if you looked at how Mao tried to build the state, um, it is very similar to how he tried to win a war, which is great for winning a war and terrible for building a stable state, which even the the even the CPC will admit today. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting that, you know, you have, I remember I talked to a, a Canadian military theorist about 15 years ago, who I think was a borderline fascist, frankly, but he was obsessed with Mao. But what he took away from Mao was Sun Tzu and then the legalists, the legalism um, that, was, that was kind of in it, both explicitly and implicitly from Chinese context, not anything Marxist. And Boyd reminds me of that. Like, um, what, what what he takes from Lenin is, you know, uh, about revolutionary defeatism and tipping points, and 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 stuff like that. Not anything about how to build um, a state or, or anything like anything out of state and revolution or anything like that. It's it's more it's more the immediately pragmatic thing of building a militant subject. Um, but I think it's also interesting when we talk about the comparison between Boyd and Beer to look at what these figures do when they try to build societies versus when they try to win wars, which is traditionally why um, the military itself has kind of 
if, a, if if the stronger the military, the usually the, the bigger the bigger insistence on on um, civilian leadership because the practices of the military to build a state are often endemic to building a state, and it's kind of like obviously so. I mean, that's not what that's not what the organization is designed to do. It's designed to fight, um, and and this. This is something that, uh, you know, you, uh, and, and there's, a, there's a fundamental truth to all state power does come out of, you know, particularly in the modern nation state, comes out of the barrel of the gun. But there's also a truth that, like, if that's all you're doing, your state's not going to last very long. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the sort of the example that gets referred back to again and again uh, in terms of state building uh, by military is the uh, post-war occupation of Japan. But it's very important to understand that, like, that state building wasn't done by the U.S. military, really. It was done by, like, cooperation between Japanese elites and a sort of intellectual and not very martial subsection of the U.S. military. <laughs> um, it, it, it's really not a military thing. Yeah. As similarly, if you look at the writings of someone like um, Neil Ferguson, who, you know, horrible British neoconservative, but he actually points out when his book on empire and why, why he thought the U.S. sucked at it um, was that um, the British realize that you can't have the military set up all the bureaucracies because they'll be set up along military lines and civilian bureaucracies don't work along military lines. Like it's, it's a, it's a basic, what is the function of this institution? Why would you bring that function into these other things? And this is something where at least post Vietnam, the U S has just never dealt with that. Like it, it partly, I think structurally because it doesn't want to admit its own imperial ambitions that directly. Um, but partly also because we've outsourced this all to the military, which is not designed or catered nor attracts the kind of people who would be particularly good at designing systems to survive, even in a colonial context. Mm. And like designing systems to survive is kind of the, the reason all this is relevant to socialists is that like, you know, we really should be thinking pretty hard about how to design systems to survive. Right. Um, and I mean, it's been a kind of it's been a thing we've been going on about forever that like you know, leftists just don't fucking think about this stuff and it's super important. So our job is to bring this to the, bring this to the masses, I guess, and get them to at least try to, try to think about some of this kind of stuff. Um, well, I mean, it's something that you have said to me, um, not off air, but is very relevant to hear the way, both in terms of strategy and in terms of institution building, the way most leftists approach this at, is basically sloganeering to activate mass cadres. Right. There's but there's not any other substance to it. There's not there actually isn't a lot of institution building for anything other than that. The 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 accumulation of cadres is not even teleologically oriented towards a specific goal a lot of the time, despite the fact, you know, uh, we want socialism. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, it's mostly psychological functions, really, if we're totally honest. Right. Right. Like, like, well, it's what it becomes, right? It, it, it becomes it becomes a way of it becomes a way of like functionally solidifying some kind of secular identity, um, and that's its function. I mean, if we take the cybernetic, you know, operative, that that's what it does. It's the function is what it does. It's not designed to win conflicts. It's not designed to even do something moderate, like decrease the Gini coefficient. Like it's not designed to do any of that. It's it's literally kind of about self orientation and self identity. Um, so how do we apply something like uh, Boyd's OODA to that problem? Yeah. So I guess that's a, it's a good opportunity for a segue. Um, so Kyle, do you want to walk us through some of the basic ideas um, here? Uh, should I give a little bit of a background on who Boyd was just to get, get us in there? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, John Boyd, uh, sorry for the late introduction here, but uh, John Boyd uh, was an American uh, he was born in 1927, and he died in 1997. Once he sort of reaches adulthood, he becomes a fighter pilot for the United States Air Force in the Korean War. Um, doesn't have a especially distinguished uh, tour of duty 
like doesn't really do anything that remarkable. He never becomes a fighter ace, anything like that. He's just kind of there, uh, participates a bit. Uh, and then his career really starts after the war when he becomes an instructor at the fighter weapons school, um, which is, you know, a sort of high end training program. Um, and he comes into his own there and really excels at air combat maneuvering. Um, he gets this nickname, uh, 42nd Boyd, Boyd, uh, because he has this running bet that he can take anybody on and beat them in 40 seconds of combat, uh, in air combat. Um, and this sort of starts to influence his intellectual trajectory uh, because he comes up with these tactics for winning in air combat, because, you know, that's what you do in a training school. You're really thinking tactically. You're thinking about how to learn uh, the sort of heuristics you need as a pilot. Like this one thing he does is that he loves to fly into the, the sun, get the sun behind his back, which is obviously nothing original in in air combat. That's like one of the most fundamental maneuvers you could do. Uh, but then he goes and does a ton of uh, really fast maneuvers while the sun is at his back to disorient his enemy and then takes them out. Um, and this sort of basic tactic that he uses becomes the basis for his like intellectual development. Uh, so he becomes the head of the academic section at the fighter weapons school, and he writes their tactics manuals. Um, and you can see based on his writing that he really does get into the academics pretty deeply. Like he's very influenced by his contemporaries uh, intellectually. Um, Wides quite uh, reads reads quite widely, and like you know, he's he's read probably a lot of this stuff that uh, you might have read. Uh, if you went through like a humanities degree in the late nineties, uh, or, or or even a science degree, <laughs> right? Heisenbergian uncertainty principle stuff that I do remember being a lot more in vogue um, in the nineties and early aughts than now. But I I think is is interesting how he's even pulling from like this is a principle from physics. Like, yeah, he's got he's got a very in that way he has a very air force mentality. Right. It's a very, very kind of like scholarly and um, uh, intellectual. Um, so, yeah, really, you know, even though he he's got this kind of military background, he's definitely sort of a, an organic intellectual of the military and one that's very, very plugged into academic networks and happenings of his time. Um so then he goes on to uh, work on the F-15 Eagle program, uh, the development program for that. Uh, and um, essentially, this program isn't really satisfactory to them because the U.S. military had this philosophy, famously, uh, following the Second World War, where they just wanted to make really big, heavy, fast fighters that could use missiles to take out their enemies. Um, and notoriously, the U.S. Air Force did very poorly compared to the Soviets and uh, other uh, enemies um, in the Korean War and the Vietnam War. Uh, and a lot of this had to do with this design philosophy. Um, so Boyd starts to push back against that philosophy um, he comes up with this idea of EM theory or energy maneuverability theory, which is not really that complicated. But if you ever like study to do like a combat flight sim or anything like the the old um, what the heck was it like the the Falcon 2.0 instructional videos from the 90s with like from Micropros and they have like an actual uh, air combat instructor who gives you lectures on on how to dogfight, like the one of the first things you're going to learn is EM theory because it's just so basic now to how people understand air combat. Um, but it basically theorizes a trade off between energy and maneuverability, and it suggests this different theory of uh, fighter development uh, to make a lightweight fighter that's very maneuverable. Uh, and this is the F 16, um, which 
in the prototype phase uh, where the purpose of the aircraft was to uh, win in dogfights, to win in air combat, uh, it very handily beat its competitors as like prototypes for where the U.S. military could go. It later went on to become like a mixed use fighter or a mixed use aircraft and had problems because it wasn't doing the thing it was designed to do, actually. Uh, but, you know, this is really a feather in Boyd's cap that, you know, he's done this astonishing thing in the prototype phase, uh, him and, and his other uh, friends who are similarly uh, a lot of sort of intellectuals. Um, after that, he is really famous for his essays and lectures on strategy uh, that are collected in his book, A Discourse on Winning and Losing, uh, which was uh, first published in 1987. Um, and as we said, he's, he's heavily influenced by cybernetics, heavily influenced by system theory, especially uh, influenced by The Art of War uh, by Xuanzi, the the ancient Chinese text that... Uh, comes out of the uh, Warring States period in China um, and uh, the thought of Marxists like Lenin and Mao. Um, he becomes hugely influential throughout the U.S. military after Vietnam, uh, but especially in the U.S. Air Force for all that like EM theory stuff and, and you know, the, 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 the doctrine of air land battle comes out of Boydianism. Um, and he's very influential as well on the U.S. Marine Corps, uh, where he essentially went in and spoke to the leaders of the Marine Corps, and they completely rewrote their doctrine uh, for operations uh, based on Boydianism. He's sort of become like this kind of like a patron saint of the Marine Corps. It's very weird, but... Like, like he's, 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 there's a definite kind of like hero worship about him uh, in the Marine Corps. Uh, so Boyd, uh, interestingly, uh, despite being quite an intellectual, he didn't write any large theoretical books. The uh, Discourse on Winning and Losing is largely just a compilation. Um, and it's mostly just lecture slides that he used in presentations in the U.S. military. Um, Imagining the most boring PowerPoints imaginable as Aristotle's text. Oh, they look so good. They look amazing. <laughs> it's so 90s. I love it. Yeah, not, not <laughs> especially scintillating stuff. Uh, maybe he was a more lively presenter. Um, uh, but... Uh, that's why we are reading Osinga as sort of an interpreter and uh, compiler of Boyd, um, uh, because, you know, there there is no like great Boyd text that you could just go and read. Um, yeah. And uh, so that's that's the basic biography on Boyd. Uh, he's his last uh, major engagement with the U.S. military was working with Dick Cheney to plan the uh, Operation Desert Storm. Um, Arguably the last successful U.S. war. <laughs> yes. Uh, so he does actually have like a kind of a, a successful engagement. Like the fact that the U.S. military did not occupy Iraq kind of lines up with Boydianism in, in ways um, uh, after De Desert Storm. Um, but uh, yeah, he, he does kind of have that to his name as well. Um, you know, despite it being a horrible bloodbath in many ways. Um, uh, and yeah, he, he kind of goes into retirement, does a little bit of advisory work and then dies in the late nineties. Um, and, uh, that, and then goes on to be used by neoliberals <laughs> <laughs> to royally fuck up the U S military. So we can thank him for that as well. <laughs> so yeah, he's been a sleeper a sleeper agent of anti-colonialism this entire time. No, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but I mean, it is fascinating though, that, um, if you look at his legacy, everything that he does, you need to use exactly as he lays it out, or it might be worse for you than not doing it. Um, this is also true in his, you know, his, his plane designs, right? Like it's designed to do a certain thing. It does this thing really well. If you wanted to do other things, it's going to suck at it. 
it's highly it's it's very subtle stuff right and if you're not as subtle as he is um then there's a pretty big risk that you're just gonna get the wrong end of the stick entirely yeah um it's it, it is uh I, I think that you know it's subtle stuff and yet also if you're used to system theory when you read it um uh, I remember when you, when you get into the the, uh, the that sixteen page essay creation and destruction and you get into the creating concepts and i'm I'm reading this and going like I don't know I think I got this from like a introductory text on systems theory like from the eighties like um but I, I also think that the military has not been historically known for operating on systems theory. He was laundering that stuff for them, yeah. I mean, it, it, like, you know, systems theory doesn't really exist without the U.S. military, but at the same time, like... Kind of like how cybernetics doesn't really exist without the Soviet Union. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and the U.S. military. Uh, but, but you know, the thing is that it's, it's like... Uh, that thing where you always have to like understand what the the patron organization is getting out of the intellectuals and what the intellectuals are getting out of the patron organization and you can't assume that those are 100 percent the same thing um because they actually have different interests <laughs> i mean it's one of the things that i find hilarious about also the streaming down of the military is it's not like you saw a massive reduction in military bureaucracy in fact what you saw is the military, instead of providing its own systems, became nothing but a bureaucracy <laughs> um, and, and some fighting forces. And then everything in the middle is outsourced. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting because it like the, because there's no like real acknowledgement of of what context that Boyd is operating under, he can't predict how stuff is going to be used. Um, which I think is actually different from some some of the more cybernetics theories who are more in, into looking at internal systems as opposed to conflict systems. I mean, it really is a different debate. Um, Beer is really concerned about how his stuff is going to be used, even if it does sometimes get used in a you know nightmare dystopian logic way. I mean, he thought about it. Whereas you, when you, as we said, when you read Boyd, it's like he just assumes that there's social harmony in the military, and all you, and really your job is to disrupt that harmony on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that's one of the that's the kind of core idea that'll keep coming up again and again throughout all Boyd. And like what what the author here is going to do is kind of try to argue that this uh, this this concept, the OODA loop, the O O D A loop, um, is I think often, sometimes when people read Boyd, they think of it as just being a purely tactical thing. But the the author will build up an argument by following Boyd's actual words that this applies at all kinds of levels from tactics through to strategy and grand strategy. Um, but the, the OODA loop is uh, observe, orient, decide, and act, um, and then go back around the loop again, observe, orient, decide, and act. And the, the kind of core of Boyd's maneuverist approach to these things is to, you should have a faster OODA loop than your enemy does, and you should speed up your own loop and also try to disrupt and slow down theirs. So you should observe faster, you should orient faster and better, you should decide faster and better, you should act faster and better, but you should also disrupt the enemy's ability to orient themselves, or their ability to decide, or their ability to observe things. Um, and that's the, that's the, that's kind of the, it's the core of the whole thing, right? Um, it's, it's a, it's a game with two agents, and they both have these loops uh, internally, and generally the one with the faster loop is going to win out. And Boyd would apply this, like, not just in the military, but it would apply to business litigation, um, law enforcement, anything, anything that involves um, oppose, uh, antagonistic conflict. This is, this is a useful strategic orientation for. Um, and importantly, the, uh, the most important of the four points in the OODA loop is the orient point the orient phase. Um, so Boyd uh, says, the second O, orientation, as the repository of our genetic heritage, cultural tradition, and previous experiences, is the most important part of the OODA loop, since it shapes the way we observe, the way we decide, the way we act. So there's kind of a way in which Boyd strikes me as a bit of an idealist um, because he thinks that like ideas and mental processes 
are really the most important thing in winning in conflict. Um, but I think that we can kind of, if we understand the mental processes as emergent out of a physical reality, we can kind of take Boyd without, uh, really going entirely on board with the, uh, sort of idealism. Now, obviously, Boyd, you know, had a materialistic uh, orientation in designing fighter aircraft and stuff like that. It's just his theory kind of leans in that direction. And I think it could be useful to kind of say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is like this is emergent. This isn't uh, this isn't Hegelianism. Right. Um, right. Well, I mean, the fact that he includes genetic heritage as part of the O loop is does indicate that he, um, maybe even unfortunately eugenically, um, considers biology one of the things from which our ideas emerge. Like that, he does take that seriously. Um, and unlike a lot of Marxists, he also like takes cultural traditions seriously because he sees them as part of the way we actually orientate our. Um, uh, our actual, like, you know, social reproduction and the way we, we would actually view things. I mean, you, you, I agree with you that this is kind of idealist and it is kind of liberal. Um, what I would, what I would push back on though, is that it corrects a lot of gross, gross, uh, unsimplifying, unemergent determinism that Marxists rely on when they're losing. You know, they never, they never actually call it up when they're winning. Um, so I, I think that's an important, an important thing. And I don't think it's far in the marks. Like, like I like to point out that even in the vulgar, you know, base superstructure metaphor relations of production, not just modes of production are part of the base and that relations of production are legal cultural constructs. Yeah. I think this, um, I think this definitely works as like, um, there, there, there's a, like Boyd might be being a bit of a, materi- a bit of an idealist, but I think there's a perfectly fine cyber materialist kind of reading of this, where the agent is orienting itself on a landscape, and that that landscape is not just like the ground beneath its feet; it's also the enemy and the agent itself, and the systems in which the agent is embedded, the material genesis of the agent. Like if you read genetic heritage as its kind of material genealogy. Um, and all of its prior experiences, like the, the new experience from the observation is being compared to prior experiences. Learning is in there. Learning is part of the landscape on which the agent is orienting. Um, I think the other thing to that is probably worth uh, pointing out in this regard is that Boyd is kind of pushing back against the engineer brain of the mid-20th century, um, where... Things are thought about in, you know, basically like quantitative terms of material or uh, like winning a war means killing as many enemies as possible. Uh, Like, you know, the the kind of like the kind of like McNamaraization of of society uh, is something that Boyd is pushing back against in his moment. And so. He's kind of pushing that uh, the 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 Orient dimension um, in order to make a point. Yeah, I mean, I think we do have to talk about how like the 20th century U.S. military, uh, from Boyd's point of view, and we'll go into this more on uh, on the episode of Patterns of Conflict, was based on the 19th century industrial model, which he thought was disastrous to militaries and less to and le- and led to way more people dying in conflict than needed to. Um, you know, on both sides, like, um, and so the idea of this pure total war of attrition, um, doesn't, you know, doesn't flow. Ironically, I I think it's interesting also to realize that Boyd's not the only, uh, you know, um, war thinker who's thinking about this. Um, I brought up fifth gen warfare a lot, but the fifth gen warfare people talk about why, um, insurgents of occupations always have an advantage because of uh, because their their goals can can actually stand way more attrition and they could still win. So you can kill like five to one in an insurgency of occupation, 
but because of the exhaustion of your own resources uh, over time, and because that the the symmetrical stakes are different. So the occupied, the, from their point of view, the stakes are total, whereas for the occupier, they're not. Um, that uh, you don't, like, the attrition calculus just doesn't work. And where this began to be thought about the most was Korea and Vietnam. Um, and especially Vietnam, right. And, and Boyd is not that, but he's coming out of the same response. Like, this doesn't work, particularly when fighting guerrilla armies. Well, let's look at, I mean, for Boyd, the study of Mao and, and Lenin is, is in some ways, particularly in the context that this guy is totally coming out of the Cold War. This is like, I must understand why my enemy is winning. Um, uh, yeah, it's worth worth mentioning that Boyd did actually fight in Vietnam. Uh, he was like a, a kind of like a squadron commander for like a, a recon squad. So he was there. Uh, he he wasn't. Uh, I, I, he seems like the last generation of generals that actually saw active combat. Um, in in the same way, not that uh, the current generals have not served any combat, but if you look at like those who fought in Korea and Vietnam versus those who came up in the eighties and like weird skirmishes in Nicaragua and Grenada, um, it's a completely different military milieu. Um, so that's also interesting, but I mean, I think, I think like some of the weirdnesses of Boyd, when I think about the way that you're trained to think in the military and I've never been a soldier, but I used to teach them, um, uh, is that, you are trained to look at your enemy as a source of inspiration for your own possible victory. And so like when someone like general Miley and current, I mean, just to tell you how, how cut off all sides of political discourse in America are from reality, but they're like, yeah, we read everything. Of course they do. Like they read it for tactical advantage. Like, um, and and I think it's interesting what Boyd learned from that. Um, I, I think I think the Orient is is the most fascinating part. It's also when you see this feedback chart, it comes up as a neat little pentagram, where everything else is just a normal flow chart. Yes, um, <laughs> it's entangled in a way that the others aren't. That that that's where the magic happens. That's that's where you do your magic summoning <laughs> circle. Uh, so if if you uh, go to Wikipedia and look up the uh, ODDA loop or the OODA loop. Uh, uh, there is a uh, like vector graphics diagram of the loop, um, and it, that's where you'll see this uh, this magic summoning circle uh, that Boyd has in the Orient uh, dimension. I'll embed it in the show notes as well, just so it's it's easy to get to. Yeah, it's it's pretty great. Should we should we move on to um, the Boyd's abstract of a discourse? Yes. Cool, Kyle. What's what's happening here? So this is. Uh, uh, I'll try to be clear here about which sections here are written by Osinga and which sections are written by Boyd because they c- it's hard to figure out. <laughs> it's you you, you kind of need to read very carefully to figure it out. Yes. Uh, so uh, Osinga here is just kind of like providing a general intellectual framework for reading Boyd and. Um, and uh, he's commenting on Boyd's abstract from his book, uh, A Discourse on Winning and Losing. Uh, so the things that Osinga uh, draws out here are that uh, Boyd proceeds from the concrete to the abstract um, in his writing um, and uh, takes a, a specific quote from Boyd here. For the interested, a careful examination will reveal that the increasingly abstract discussion surfaces a process of reaching across many perspectives, pulling each and every one apart in analysis, all the while intuitively looking for those parts of the disassembled disassembled perspectives which naturally interconnect with one another to form a higher order, more general elaboration or synthesis of what is taking place. Um, so yeah, uh, kind of, is is this, no, sorry, this is from Osinga. This is from Osinga. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, this is his like, okay, this is, this is what, uh, Boyd is doing in his general intellectual effort. Um, and 
it's a little bit hard to say, like to for me to tell if Osinga is saying this or Boyd is saying this, because Boyd actually does deal with this explicitly in the next section we're going to read. Uh, so this isn't just like a like I I read Hegel and I'm taking dialectics uh, from there and uh, reading Boyd, which doesn't have anything to do with that, and then uh, uh, giving you this intellectual framework. He's really just summarizing what Boyd is going to say. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. Shall we, shall we roll into it then? Or go ahead, Derek. Yeah. Well, I was actually trying to figure out, um, is this closer, when I was reading this, is this closer to dialectics or to, uh, to abduction, or is it somewhere between both? Oh, I think it's fair to say that... Uh, so for the readers who don't know, um, abduction is a uh, it's a process whereby you discover things in your research that surprise you. Um, it's it's sort of like out of the research, a new perspective emerges Um, And it's not in a deductive sense or an inductive sense. It's kind of like, oh, there's a gap here and I see a new perspective. So like when you look at something like um, there's a whole empirical school of research in the social sciences that came out of grounded theory and 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 brings in American pragmatism and abduction to try to figure out a better way for social scientists to not just mold reality to fit their interpretive framework or just list a bunch of shit without any um, actual theory emerging out of it. Uh, And so abduction is this kind of focus on where something comes out of the research process that is original and is neither deduction nor induction. But Boyd then makes that process dialectical in that there's a continuous loop of building building up a model, having it being surprised, breaking it down, rebuilding it, and constantly iterating based on surprise. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of the section in Marx's forward, one of Marx's forwards to Capital about the method of ascent and the method of descent. Yeah, so it's just, I, th- I think this is interesting, and I wanted to bring it up because Boyd's one of these figures where you could read him as an analytic, or you could read him as something akin to a continental and misread him, whereas I think both things are going on. Um, And and, uh, because we all realize that, like, analytics don't like the dialectic word, and um, even when they're doing it. And uh, a lot of people use dialectics to mean they never have to learn standard logic. So I just found that interesting. I was trying to figure out where... where you peeps placed it on that spectrum. And it seemed to me like it was, it was kind of both, but, but in being both, it actually was beyond either one of them. Like it was not because there's a way in which like with traditional dialectics, particularly in the Hegelian form, you you can assume what you want to prove um, through, through like, well, the, the necessary synthesis is X um, which is something, actually, if you read Marx's critique of Hegel's philosophy in general, despite the fact that kind of reads like a new atheist rant, um, that he's actually glomming on to, but Marx never felt confident in working out why that was true in Hegel. Like, um, so he never published that critique. Um, but it's it's an interesting thing to see, because I think this is this is that, where, like, you're not you're not assuming you know what the synthesis necessarily will be. Um, are the off you bung, if I want to use like the correct before people get mad at me and start yelling about me using incorrect Hegelian dialectic terminology? For Boyd, it's very much um, an outward facing process of discovery where you assume that you're going to be surprised and that you, you you assume that you won't know where the process will lead, which is, as you say, it's quite different from the way this stuff is sometimes used where it's like, I'm just going to you know, decide on something up front and then do a wiggly waggly process to get there. Uh, for for Boyd, you have to be. I guess it, it, it's it's from this whole antagonistic kind of perspective, right? Where you you kind of have to assume that you just don't know everything yet, and that the world could surprise you. Like that that sound of a twig snapping behind you really could be an actual threat that you didn't perceive before, and you need to react to it, take it seriously. You know, there's no presumption that all of this stuff is emerging out of the idea. 
So, so it takes uncertainty principle and Gurgle's theorem very seriously. Like the idea that you can know something accurately or precise, uh, was it accurate or precisely, but not both. Um, and, uh, and that you, you know, there's a real sense that you can't know every, neither every factor nor every outcome of a situation, which, which to be honest, if you have dialectics that, that takes that seriously, you know, the kind of emergent dialectics, it's actually a very different thing than the way, I'm not going to put this on Marx, I actually don't think Marx is consistently uh, in violation of this, although sometimes he is, um, I will say that later Marxists just impute that they know what the outcome of a dialectic will be. Like, um, the contradictions of capitalism necessarily mean communism, communism necessarily means the USSR, etc. Um, and Boyd would laugh at that. Yeah, and he'd be right to. Um, so so what, we're, what we're talking about here is the, the section on uh, destruction and creation, which I believe is... Is this just a verbatim reproduction of the essay? Yeah, I think so. That's right. It is. It is. It is in the book. Osinga has reproduced verbatim Boyd's essay uh, with uh, footnotes that he has written himself. Uh, sorry, that 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 Osinga has written about Boyd. So it's very much like a classic. Like here is the text, and you get the interpreter's point of view in the footnotes, um, uh, and. Um, but it's not clear where it starts at first. Like, like, like it just goes cur- destruction and creation introduction. And you're just like, wait, but okay, where am I at? Like who, who's, who, who's, who's, yeah, it's very, very confusing because this chapter is composed of multiple sections and it's only in the section on destruction and creation that Boyd's work is presented verbatim. And the other stuff is Osinga's interpretation, and that isn't marked out in any clear way, other than the headings. Um, and and but even the destruction and creation heading, the introduction is still written by Osinga, even though it's not tagged as such. You only know that because it mentions Boyd in third person. Yes, that's right. So the point the point here is that um, uh, this is the only essay, like traditional prose discourse that Boyd wrote and included in um, a discourse on winning and losing. So he can, so Zinga can just quote that verbatim, but the other stuff, you can't do that because you need to like fill in what people in Boyd's lectures actually got out of those lecture slides. So does Boyd's text begin at abstract? That's what I think it does, right? Okay. Yes, that's correct. That is correct. Yes. Um, so just as a kind of basic introduction to the, to what this is, uh, this is an essay by Boyd, 16 pages. It's the basis for his subsequent work and thoughts. Um, it is based on mathematical logic, physics, and thermodynamics. Um, it also combines ideas from Gödel's, uh, incompleteness theorem, uh, Heisenberg's, uh, uncertainty principle and the second law of thermodynamics. So like pretty much, you know, like the, 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 the hits of the, of the 20th century, right? Like in terms of, in terms of like, what were the, the, the biggest ideas of what was going on intellectually at that time, uh, pops that in, uh, also draws on philosophy of science, uh, from Polanyi, uh, Popper and Kuhn, uh, so you get your your big hits there too, um, and uses uh, Osinga doesn't mention this, but definitely uses dialectical reasoning throughout, uh, with some structuralism thrown in. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, like old school, basic uh, uh, structuralism, not not post structuralism, but like the stuff that actually comes out of like theory of language. Um, yeah, Claude Levi Strauss, Cesaire, early 20th century structuralism, not Foucault. Um, and then, yeah, it's it's Boyd's writing verbatim. So we're actually reading Boyd here. Um, so maybe I should just read the abstract and then we'll get into it. Uh, yeah, so this is very succinct. It's worth reading just verbatim. Uh, so Boyd writes, To comprehend and cope with our environment, we develop mental patterns or concepts of meaning. 
The purpose of this paper is to sketch out how we destroy and create these patterns to permit us to both shape and be shaped by a changing environment. In this sense, the discussion also literally shows why we cannot avoid this kind of activity if we intend to survive on our own terms. The activity is dialectic in nature, generating both disorder and order that emerges as a changing and expanding universe of mental concepts matched to a changing and expanding universe of observed reality. So very cybernetic um, and very much oriented to the environment and also something that, you know, doesn't really sound like typical U.S. military boilerplate prose. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I was about to say, I could actually, like, I was reading this, and I'm like, I could even hear Deepak Chopra say this, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But what... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, I think it's... Tr- I think as a general principle, it's true enough. Like, you, you're dealing with the fact that your mental constructions of the terrain cannot necessarily... Um, be accurate to the actual observed reality because both are changing uh, in dynamic response to each other. So, so like any model that you would have would have to be dynamic enough to change with new observations and thus the model is constantly remaking itself. Um, and I mean, this, this concept, like this sort of thinking and like the, you know, uncertainty principle, all that stuff, quantum mechanics, it, it all got abused by new age thinkers in a pretty serious way, but it doesn't invalidate people who are using it necessarily. Uh, just, you just should, uh, you should maybe raise an eyebrow in the, in the same way you do when you see dialectical. Yeah. Re- reject woo bullshit. Return to Heisenberg. Yeah. <laughs> just go back to the source. You don't need to have any of the woo bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, but it is interesting how, like, when I re- when I was reading this, I was like, okay, Derek, this is not woo bullshit. I'm not reading, like, an integralist text. This is actual serious stuff. Because I have seen this kind of thing, you know, so many times in that regard. Um, but I, I think what, what's interesting here is you have, like, an idea of dynamic realism. Like, if, like, I was going to name what, what's actually being described here, it's like, it is not that you can't... Th- there's a way in which, for example, in continental philosophy, that they automatically go to the reductio ad absurdum. That since you can't, since the model is not the terrain, and thought is like a language, which I actually don't believe is actually true, but whatever. Um, if so facto, um, reality is totally subjective, and and uh, um, which which you know, I guess, impressed people in the '70s, but like. That's not what this is at all. Like, this is more like you have to accept that your mental concepts are never going to be precisely mo- like mapping on the terrain and they must, and the terrain is changing itself. It is not a static mechanical world. Yeah. And I, I think this is really similar to um, the sort of groundwork chapters you get in Brain of the Firm. Mm, um, and yeah. Boyd doesn't, or sorry, Beer doesn't um, explicitly state these principles in the same way that Boyd does. But if you look at like what he actually does in the Chilean Revolution, he's definitely putting these ideas into practice. Um, it, like he he is thinking in this way, even if he didn't write, you know, destruction and creation uh, exactly. So if we if we skip forward to this small section on when he gets to like because he goes over some of like the basic stuff like the goal is to survive, um, you're operating in an environment that's hostile, and as we said before, Boyd is basically it's a Hob- he's a Hobbesian um, through and through. So um, uh, and and that makes him different from Beer, who is an Aristotelian. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and then the the need for decision arises in this like operating in a hostile environment. Um, the OODA loop is necessary for survival. But then if we're observing and we're orienting ourselves um, and then trying to decide and act, then we need to think about how how are we going to generate our mental concepts? How are we going to generate our map of the world and as best to support the decision-making activities? Um, yeah, so, like, well, just to link this back to the OODA loop, 
it's like if the observe or sorry, if the orient phase is the most important part of the loop, how do we generate the constituents of the orient phase? Yeah, exactly. The, the parts of the model. That's what be, that's what Boyd is focusing on here. Yeah. Um, the creating concepts section kind of gets, he, he spells it up pretty explicitly. It's very easy to follow. Um, that there are two ways in which we develop and manipulate our mental concepts of re- observed reality. We either start from the whole and break it down into parts, which is deduction and analysis, or we start from the parts and we build it up into a whole, which is induction and th- synthesis. Um, and these are the two legs of the process. You're breaking breaking a large concept down into smaller things, or you're assembling Lego parts to make a different concept. Um, yeah, and uh, just to sort of link back to the idea of abduction, that would actually be a third thing that would go in here, but like people weren't really reading Pierce very much at this time. <laughs> so like it's something that comes out of American pragmatism and is... <clears throat> really quite obscure at this period of time. It's, it gets revived, like, at the late 20th century. I was about to say, it gets revived, like, in the early aughts, but, um, it, but it, it seems like that's part of what, what uh, Boyd is getting at. Um, yes, yes. He just doesn't have the logical terminology to speak about it, so he's trying to speak about it in terms of deduction and induction. The, the abduction is definitely the thing that corresponds to the third leg of the, of the process with the suspicion angle that we'll get to later. Which I think is, it was quite interesting. I also think it's, it's fascinating that he, instead of pulling from like classical philosophy, because the specific, the, this is a distinction that goes all the way back um, to, you know, Plato and Aristotle, um, maybe even to Pythagoras. Um, th- he picks on, you know, the difference between calculuses, like integral and differential calculus, which I thought was very useful and and not getting into like the humanities mystification parts um, that we normally fall into um, by showing that like no this is you know, like you see this even practically in different kinds of math like and so he walks us through then like okay imagine a domain imagine some concepts and then imagine another domain and some concepts imagine that you um, break the things down like you 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 sort of shatter the bindings between concepts and then mix and match across domains. You find the connecting threads um, and then rebuild a new con- a new kind of synthesis. That's the so you have a sort of destructive motion of unstructuring your understanding of a domain and then a constructive or creative um, operation of building up a new understanding based on recombination with other elements. Right, so this is basically Deleuze and Guattari, but without all of the theory speak. Without the without the fucking frog weirdness, yeah. <laughs> yeah, w- w- without without and without making um, perfectly logical scientific assumptions start to become irrational um, through reassertion. But whatever. Um, but yes, it is. It is like if you took all the bullshit out of Deleuze and Guattari and got to what was good in them, that would be. This is what's good in them. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and so for Boyd, this is the, the uh, for Boyd and Deleuze and Guattari, this is the process of changing our perception of reality with this um, this two stroke process of destruction of concepts and then creation of concepts. Um, but it's it's a process that is um, there are breaks put on this by basically uh, the the need for reality checks and consistency checks that like if if the model of the world is going to be of any use to us, it needs to be internally consistent and it needs to be consistent with the world. Um, so while we're going around this loop, we're constantly checking to see if anything's out of place and breaking down and rebuilding uh, to get towards a better understanding of the world. But then again, the world is moving, so you have to, you have to make your thought go as fast as the world if you want to keep up with it. Yeah, so if, if you look at the OODA loop, uh, this is why the, absur- uh, sorry, the observe step is connected into the orient step. And the act step is connected into the observe step, right? Uh, it's very, like, pragmatist in that sense, right? Mm-hmm. You get a fit with your... It, it, like, once your actions feed back onto the world, you're kind of testing for the fit between your model and the world. Yes. It's very... It's, it, it is very, like, concurrently developing similar theories to Charles Peirce. Yes, then the suspicion section. Uh, Derek, what's this, bit, what's this bit about? This is where the abduction comes in, right? Yeah, the suspicion is like this idea that you you have to be aware that your concepts uh, are necessarily 
incomplete and it contain um, at some point, I'm just going to quote verbatim here, ambiguities, uncertainties, anomalies are apparent inconsistencies which may emerge to stifle a more general and precise matchup of the concept with the realities. And we have to suspect this, not just admit that this is the case. So it's so the idea here is you should not just have this idea that, oh, it could be the case that there's going to be ambiguities or inconsistencies. No, no, no. Um, because of Heisenbergian uncertainty principle, um, I should assume at all times that um, – there's going to be ambiguities and inconsistencies which we're going to need to redirect. And thus, this is what this is the part that I thought rhymed with abduction. The, the, you must be willing to be surprised that your model is not um, all explanatory. And, you know, um, it was a talking, I, I, this is the part to me that, like, where, where at one sense, like, this, is com- this has been common sense and, and, and and like planning and practical uh, applications in the '90s, um, but that uh, apply like leftists fundamentally don't believe this anymore. <laughs> so, oh yeah, this this is like the the immortal science fucking mo- nonsense, and like uh, yeah, <laughs> right, and yeah, like and, and the it violates these principles and therefore can't be scientific. Right, in the, the eternal strategy, like, uh, and all, all talks of, like, you know, necessary outcomes and stuff. It's just like, well, that brackets out all ambiguities, all inconsistencies, all the fact that we know that the map and the terrain can't be the same thing. Like, that's, like, that's a fundamental problem for, for some of these people. And... Which is why people are constantly being fucking surprised, right? Like uh, leftists and or people in general, right, are endlessly fucking surprised by developments in the world. And it's like, okay, if you've got, if you, if you seem to have this huge, like, like well-worked out scientific model of the world, why is everything so fucking surprising? Well, it's, it's, it's that because we don't have that attitude of, a, of, of, of fundamentally assuming incompleteness and a willingness to be surprised during sort of the procedure of events that we are shocked when we are surprised right because it's like the surprise breaks through the model for a while and then you have to reassemble it again and 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 build up the the barriers to uh uncertainty once again Whereas Boyd is short-circuiting all of that by just assuming it up front, right? As- assume you will be surprised. Assume you will turn out to be wrong. And it's like, you- you're-, you're untouchable. It's like, I'm- I'm- there's no way I could possibly ever be owned. I'm- I'm- I always just assume I'm going to be owned anyway. Right. I mean, it's, it's-, it's actually fascinating from the standpoint of psychology, which is not something that Boyd's pulling as much from, interestingly. But, like, the- this-, this creates a feedback check against your own... Um, Stability biases, survivor biases, heuristics of, who, of dampening cognitive dissonance. Because what this does, if you took it seriously and actually internalized it, it makes cognitive dissonance your friend as opposed to something that you're constantly fighting against. It does. It's a fuel that you can use. And I guess like, I can kind of see how for some, I, I can see how some people are kind of sketched out a little bit by uh, the fact that like, the notion of like reality checks and stuff are often deployed in a kind of like conservative, cranky sort of mode. Like it's it's often a conservative rhetorical trick to say like reality check and that kind of stuff. But like if we are in any way serious about changing the world for the better, we need to be internalizing this kind of reality check model of like suspicion of our own ideas because we can't afford to cede that to the conservatives, you know? It's 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 kind of the way that a lot of the left and definitely almost all liberals have have taken um, any critique of um, organizational sclerosis as inherently conservative, um, um, and to me this is just a this is not just a way to like it's a way to make sure that a that you can't build a society and that you actually are you actually become more subject to stochastic forces. Um, 
And B, like, so you're not, you can't adapt and change to it. And B, like, you can't even admit that that's what's going on. Mm-hmm. So, double so like, it's a way to build something that, like, is hyper fragile. Um, but it's also fragile at being fragile. <laughs> you know, it's like a double loss. <laughs> yeah, it's like not even good at that. Like, <laughs> it's a shitty kind of fragility. It's, you know. It's the worst kind. It's like the male fragility of the dude bro, but, like, at a systemic level. <laughs> Yikes. So... Uh, Boyd will bring us through the three things um, first being uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem um, and basically I guess for, for anyone that doesn't know it like basically uh, Kurt Gödel blew a hole in mathematics and logical systems in the early 20th century by kind of proving that um, in a given logical system or I guess a system of concepts um, it can't be both complete and consistent Basically, there, there's always a kind of, like, um, incompleteness to it. There, and by incompleteness, he means that there are true statements that can't be expressed and, like, worked out in the system. Um, and, yeah, this this just means that, like, no no map will ever be big, uh, be accurate enough to actually cover the territory. Um, right. So, basically, some axioms in the system cannot be justified within the system itself. They have to be either just assumed or come from an, a, a different set of proofs and it's actually amazing to me when i was rereading uh research on golto and watching videos to explain it to me because i was like i remember learning this in college and like no one's talked about it in 10 years um i feel like it's still a big deal let me go back and look at it and then i was like oh this shit's really basic this is like an like like in a way he proves it with like yes there's complicated math involved but his ultimate proof is like this statement yeah it's like a logical paradox this statement cannot be justified within this truth set without creating a paradox. Therefore. So the, the way I've um, seen it explained, and it's, it's probably useful for the listeners, right? That like, if you have a, if you have a system in which you can build a statement that says this statement is false, then the, the, the system is incomplete in that sense that it, it has, um, it has ambiguities. It has, it has like true expressions that it can't actually resolve. Um, and then you might think, oh, well, okay, let's just forbid self-reference so I can't use the word this to refer to this this sentence. But then you get around it by saying the following statement is false and then the previous statement is true. And, you know, so that's kind of some of what Gödel was doing is just kind of demonstrating that there's always these kind of escape hatches through which you can kind of get to incompleteness and inconsistency. Right, so even modal logic doesn't get you out of the problem. Uh, so... If for for listeners, uh, if you want more on this uh, and you're interested in the beer, uh, sorry, the brain of the firm reading group, uh, beer has a whole chapter on this problem uh, of meta languages addressing uh, lower level languages, um, which is in, pretty early on in uh, brain of the firm. And for for Boyd, this all just means basically that like um, you're con- you're. Con- your conceptual model cannot be entirely consistent with itself, um, and it can't entirely be consistent with the world. Um, they are both necessarily incomplete. Um, and so, but even when we use observations to sharpen up the concepts, and then we use the concepts to sharpen our observations, we're still going around an incomplete loop. Um, we just have to accept, accept that. That's fine. Uh, indeterminacy and uncertainty, where he brings in Heisenberg and the indeterminacy principle, or uncertainty principle, I think is how it's, it's often referred to. Um... For the, I think for Heisenberg, this is kind of basically like if you observe something um, like a particle or some object, let's just say an object, you can either measure it, you can either measure its like position to an extreme degree of um, certainty, but you lose track of its uh, velocity, or you measure its velocity very accurately, but you, you lose track of its position. So you can't know both of those at the same time. Um, and it, it, in some sense, this is kind of like about the way the probe interacts with the um, with the object, right? So, like, if you're if you're me- measuring, you know, velocity, like, how do you measure velocity? You, you, do you like put something in front of the thing to like like a sensor to like stop it from moving? But then, if you if you interact with it in that way, you've actually slowed its velocity. So, you know, um, or like if something doesn't weigh very much and you want to weigh it, or or you want to get a, a sense for some of its internal properties, like the probe might actually destroy the thing you're measuring. Um, so anyway, it's you, you can't know both of these facts about the thing in perfect detail, um, and then for Boyd, this I guess this this section is a little bit tricky. But where it comes back to is that um, when the uh, so I'm, I'm just going to read read it out actually. Um, the quote: 
When the intended distinction between observer and observed begins to disappear, the uncertainty values hide or mask phenomena and, or behaviour. Or, put another way, the observer perceives uncertain or erratic behaviour that bounces all over in accordance with the indeterminacy relation. Under these circumstances, the uncertainty values represent the inability to determine the character or nature, the consistency of a system within itself. So this is, for Boyd, specifically about a system that's trying to measure itself. Like, or if, if you are operating within a system of thought and trying to refine it using only its own parts, then you kind of open yourself up to this huge indeterminacy because, um, because of the relation between the probe and the probed. Um, just kind of fundamentally brings this uncertainty to bear. Uh, yeah, so this gets back to sort of like the core ideas of second order cybernetics, right? Um, uh, once the cybernetician is included in the system that's being observed, these kinds of problems uh, uh, appear. And it's a problem because the, the observer is a complex object observing a complex object. So like for, for the Heisenberg stuff, like a, a complex observer of a simple object is fine. But a complex observer of a complex object is going to be very, very uncertain. And that kind of goes doubly so if the complex object is you and you are observing yourself. Um, so there are hard limits to self-observation. There are, there are hard limits to operating inside of yourself uh, as a system. Um, because those those magnitudes of uncertainty just go through the roof. Um, but this but this is also like the basic truth of why social science, even if it was actually like, and I actually do defend social sciences as actual sciences, despite assertions to the contrary, that their complexity means that any any conclusion that you'd make from them has to be so tentative as to almost be useless. Um, and and I say that like as a believer that there is there is this thing as social science, but this is why everyone's gold standard is physics, because it, it is a complex thing observing the most simple fucking things in the universe. <laughs> and that's infinitely complex feeling. Even. But like, imagine trying to use a particle accelerator to study a particle accelerator. Like it wouldn't work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the uncertainty would be way too high, whereas you can use a particle accelerator to study, or like you, you can use an electron microscope to study electrons, but you can't use it to study an electron microscope, you know, because it's, it's just the, the, the complexity mismatch is, is far too much. So this makes history a dismal science. <laughs> because it happens in real time, and it's complex. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a complex observer but watching infinitely more complex observers. Uh huh. <laughs> it's grim. The the problem here, like, is that in the 18th and 19th centuries, um, you know, we basically got so enthusiastic with uh, math and physics um, that we assumed this problem didn't exist uh, <laughs> anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the Newton mechanical model of the universe and society. Like, we forget the and society part. Mm. Well, it's, it's why Gödel's incompleteness theorem was such a fucking, like, a heartbreaker, because, like, you had Whitehead and these kind of guys trying to, like, formalize all of mathematics in one system. And this guy just comes in and fucking clowns them from out of nowhere and verifies that it can't be done and just breaks a lot of hearts, you know? Like, like set theory's over. <laughs> it's done. Pack up and go home, folks, you know? It, it's like in um, in Hegel, you get a way of dealing with the Kantian antinomies, uh, but like incompleteness, like sabotages Hegel at an even more fundamental level than that, right? Like there's already this idea of sort of negativity in Hegel and like, you know, opposed things and all this kind of stuff and contradiction and, you know, all that kind of thing. But when you get to, you know, this really solid proof that we get from Goodall, it really just like blows the whole thing up. Uh, this this whole project of um, understanding the world that that really gets going with Newton, yeah. And isn't isn't it fucking astonishing that like f almost for for most socialists or most most like strands of socialist thought, just don't account for any of this stuff, like. No, they, they actually have actively gone backwards on this since the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, 
where like we can we, you have Badu trying to resurrect set theory just in basic not dealing with this fact you have um you have people uh trying to resurrect hegelianism as a as a immortal science but you know what they often do to make it seem more plausible is they don't they you know even bracketing out how much religious stuff is in hegel um explicitly frankly um they also psychologize everything so it's no longer under the realm of uh something you can prove with this proven material history um and so it seems immune to these sorts of claims but that's like the, you know not to bring up something like, like the Sokol hoax but that was really what that kind of exposed for me was just like oh so much of this theory is a way to not address some stuff from the past that fundamentally blows up assumptions um, that we just kind of have that we have a that we could have an all-knowing singular science of human relations and this that or the other um, and and I think um, I mean to use the parlance of the internet I think a lot of this re- re- reversion back to older forms of of logic or whatever as somehow superior forms is basically just a cope that 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 also kind of is is impotent making like you can't do anything with this stuff actually like um you know but it's really good for solidifying your own knowledge so like when i when i approach this i often don't mention these things directly but i talk about their psychological effects but fundamentally like like if you're if you're saying that we know from an event in 1917 exactly how to construct a socialist utopia now um when conditions are with, with even like from a Marxist standpoint, almost all conditions of relation and production are different than the USSR, then you you just aren't dealing with reality at all. You're, you're exempting yourself from any kind of reality check. Um, yeah. Well, like Boyd, Boyd hits the nail on the head so well in this, like back in the suspicion section where he he's kind of laying out like if like, OK, so we have to assume that we could be surprised by new data because if if we took the opposite, we'd actually end up in a very vexing position where we're insisting that new observations couldn't possibly change the model. And that just doesn't smell right, does it? That's kind of what he's saying there. And yet we see this all the time. <laughs> yeah, and all the fucking time. And so Boyd, like that, that, that stuff hit me like a ton of bricks when Boyd was saying that kind of stuff. I was like, OK, well, like we have to have this suspicion and we have to have this iterative refinement of the model because the alternative is untenable but then i was like oh my fucking god like that alternative the untenable alternative is a pretty fucking large bulk of socialist and marxist theory like uh, (laughs) you know yeah the um the the revival of abduction at the beginning of the 21st century um was a response to grounded theory, which was itself a reaction to the problems of sort of applying an invariant Marxist conceptual system to social uh, science research. Um, so like, w- this is like directly <laughs> related, <laughs> like the revival of, 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 of abduction is like one step removed from that problem, right? Because the reaction was to go, we'll just do induction. And then it's like, well, yeah, but induction can't actually generate conceptual systems. So yeah. Um, yeah. Brutal. Um, the uh, third justification for the suspicion is going to be entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. Um Ah, oh, it's good stuff. I love a bit of entropy. I love a good slice of entropy in the morning. Uh, se- second, second law of thermodynamics just recently uh, violated in physics. Very interesting. Oh, interesting. Uh, uh, time crystals were developed by Google, which actually violate the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, not in the general sense, but in, in the, the sense. specific sense. Yeah, in the local sense. Because eventually you're going to run out of power to run the system, and then you, the, the the second law will apply. But in that local system, the second law doesn't apply. Well, I guess it's a, it's a sort of neglected part of the second. I, does the second law does specify that it it can allow, or doesn't it? I don't know that, that it can allow for local reversals. No, it does. It does. That's like that's what. 
Right. That's why, like, evolution happens and it's not totally degenerative as we have the sun giving us outside power. Yeah, it's just that the the time crystal is reproducing exactly the same pattern of order uh, uh, across across time, and therefore it is breaking the second law. Uh, uh, Whoa, that's fascinating. But it requires an immense amount of power to do, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yes. But yeah, go go read up on it, listeners. It's fun stuff. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to find a link for that for the show notes. Um, but again, for listeners who may maybe not totally familiar, entropy is this like concept in physics, and it, it comes up in information theory as well, but like um, it's kind of inversely related to capacity for action. So in a high entropy scenario, you have very little capacity to, to act, and in a low entropy scenario, you have high capacity to act. Uh, it's also related to the degree of confusion or disorder. So if you imagine a teacup sitting on a table, that's a, um, a low entropy system. And if the teacup f- uh, falls onto the ground and smashes, it goes into a high entropy state. Um, the general law is that entropy tends to just increase. Um, so teacups do sp- spontaneously fall, out, fall down and break, but they don't spontaneously reassemble themselves. Um, and that's actually related to the way we experience time. That um, in general, a, a, we experience time as having this arrow that moves in the direction of entropy increasing. Um, which means that, in general, for natural processes, entropy and confusion and disorder increase uh, in a closed system, um, notably. So in, in an open system that's re- receiving new energy and information, such as the Earth, this isn't the case for the Earth overall. But when the sun dies out and all stars die out and everything kind of cools to an approximately equal temperature, then, you know, entropy will be maximum. But for the moment things are structured, they will tend to become unstructured. Yeah, so just to put this in a very simple uh, example, uh, it's like, you know, uh, when you have ADHD and you go into hyperfocus and you act in this incredibly uh, fast and focused way, uh, you crash immediately afterwards because your capacity for action has been depleted by going from a low entropy state to a very high entropy state. Uh, in a really quick amount of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'll read out the quote here from Boyd. Accordingly, whenever we attempt to do work or take action inside such a system, a concept and its matchup with reality, we should anticipate an increase in entropy, hence an increase in confusion and disorder. Naturally, this means we cannot determine the character or nature or consistency of such a system within itself, since the system is moving irreversibly towards a higher, yet unknown state of confusion and disorder. So basically, like a closed self-referential system of concepts, or a you know, any closed self-referential system, can only have this steadily increasing, increasing confusion um, and decreasing capacity for action. What does that remind you of, folks? You know, all the stuff we've been talking about. <laughs> a self-referential system that just has increasing confusion and decreasing capacity for action. Hmm. Mm. I wonder. Yeah, I, I like this because it actually... Um, it actually gets by connecting this into incompleteness, it gets away from the Platonism that is often implied by incompleteness or the approach to incompleteness. Cause like Gödel himself was a Platonist, right? Um, uh, so, so like, you know, usually we'll think about this as like, Oh yeah, there's like this math system out there in the world. And like, it's, I don't know, it exists in a, a higher plate of thought or something. But if we actually like say like, well, you can get to a similar kind of problematic by talking about something that's immensely or like just eminently physical, like thermodynamics, which really just comes initially out of heat dissipation, um, uh, then it's actually like an angle on the thing that doesn't sort of lead you towards the uh, idea that there's like a higher realm of thought that exists outside of time. And yeah. Yeah, the mathematics is not, right, there's not this, like, platonic order outside of all time and dimensionality, and we're just accessing it. Um, It brings you towards computationalism, right, where, um, so, like, in in the platonic sort of notion, like, you can ask a question, like, what is the last digit of pi? And that makes sense there, but if you move to more like a Turing kind of model of computation, like, as in material computation, um, it's a senseless question, because if, if you start to calculate the numbers of the digits of pi, by definition, the final digit of pi is the last one you see before the sun burns out. 
because it's a it's a physical process. Computation is a physical process, and it's not a kind of ethereal, abstract kind of thing like like mathematics was framed as. Um, so all, all these are definitely related. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Um, when I finally grokked at this uh, about ten years ago, it was actually through a David Foster Wallace text on the history of infinity. Um, when we were talking about like the difference between the platonic conception and the computational conception of infinities and how you can have infinities with infinities with infinities. And from a platonic conception, that'll drive you insane. But from a computational conception, it's like, well, yeah, but that's just because you can do this infinitely in any set of infinite sets. So you, since you don't have infinite time, it's kind of a null question. Like, yeah. And, and like, you can, you can do it while, like to tie it into thermodynamics, you can do that computation while you have a heat engine on your side, but once the room warms up to the same temperature as the CPU, all possibility for computation ceases, and that, thus the the infinite calculation just stops, and that's it. So it's I, I find that I find that fascinating. I've also found this I find this interesting in um, something that I've been rereading, um, which is uh, which I don't which is based off some of these theories, which is uh, um, Joseph Tainter's uh, The Rising Collapse of, of Complex Societies, um, which talks about entropy and complexity theory that social systems tend to, de- to generate complexity and that complexity requires more and more energy to sustain. That energy dissipates in the confusion and the social systems become highly inoperable um, off of this. Uh, but he actually, uh, Tainter actually doesn't think this is totally inevitable. Um, that like there is a way in which if you if you factor that into your system and you start having um, if you start creating more and more creative destruction, um, to use a terrible capitalist term, but is actually useful here, um, you are freeing up you, you by by actually enacting controlled disorder. You are actually lessening confusion and freeing up resources to reinvest back into the energy system of the social of the social network, um, and that seems to be kind of what Boyd is doing in battle. That's why it's so interesting to me that all these ideas were like coming out of like para academia in the eighties and nineties, and then we kind of dropped them. Um, yeah, certainly, that is definitely what he's getting to here with this. Like, um, I'm just I'm going to read out the paragraph. Uh, What an interesting outcome. According to Gödel, we cannot, in general, determine the consistency, hence the character or nature, of an abstract system within itself. According to Heisenberg and the Second Law of Thermodynamics, any attempt to do so in the real world will expose uncertainty and generate disorder. Taken together, these three notions support the idea that an inwardly oriented and continued effort to improve the matchup of concept and observed reality will only increase the degree of mismatch. Um, But then he does go on to say that doesn't need to be the case because we can do this dialectical process of destructuring and restructuring to re-inject new fresh energy and fresh information into the system. So it doesn't need to degenerate. I mean, there really is a way in which both the Vermeer and and uh, and the thesis on Feuerbach actually come into play here. Um, um, whereas, like. E- we are subject to these natural processes. If we understand the natural processes, we can manipulate them in ways that would benefit us. But we have to admit that they're there. And but what's interesting is some of these natural processes seem to, at the one time, Marx is like intuiting this, and at the other time, the entire system of Marxism that we've accumulated goes in the opposite direction. And like for Boyd, the, the answer is to turn outwards. As well as doing this creative destructive process of reshaping the system, you have to turn outwards and be radically sensitive to the environment and to changing conditions, which is what historical Marxism is not very good at, right? Marx originally is quite good at it, but, you know, the the tradition we've inherited is fucking terrible at this stuff. Um, And ironically, this is what leads Boyd to read Marxists. (laughs) It's very funny. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, I mean, it is true, and, and Marx, Marxists were actually very flexible on this point until we had states to defend. Well, yeah, yeah, like he's he's reading Marxists who are who are writing in an insection, insurrectionary moment, yeah, right, as opposed to Marxists in their state building or institution building moment, which is are are when they be, or where Marxism becomes an academic hobby of of certain humanities fields in the seventies, like like he, he would have no interest in that. Um. Yeah, there's there's like some ways in which his work kind of like rhymes with post-structuralism, but like you don't 
really need to read post-structuralists to get there, as we've kind of been talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting... Yeah, it's interesting how much actually post-structuralism, if, if we look at these kind of traditions, does seem to emerge out of something real, but it's its eventual answers and codifications go into La La Land. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's trapped in that swamp of, like, French, French academia and its own, like, class interests and that, that just sort of the, the, the drive to obscurity and that sort of stuff. But, like, I mean, the, often the core concepts are really good and compelling and are good answers to previous problems, but, like, it's just wrapped up in thousands of pages of fucking horseshit, you know? If only none of them have read Heidegger. <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, I mean, it is interesting how, how also it proves that most of these points we could actually say clearly. Because I think you can give this to a person with a high school education, and they could they could derive something pretty clearly out of this. Whereas, like, if I gave, like, Deleuze and Guattari to a person with a high school education, which I have done, um, it might be trying to do Platonist witchery or something in a few weeks. I have no idea. Uh, yeah, so uh, Boyd's quote here is, uh, we find that the uncertainty and disorder generated by an inward-oriented system talking to itself can be offset by going outside and creating a new system. Simply stated, uncertainty and related disorder can be diminished by the direct artifice of creating a higher and broader, more general concept to represent reality. Take that, Leninists. (laughs) Yeah, take that. And I mean, ironically, this is like, this is what Marxist revolution is supposed to be. It's supposed to. Right. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But we must remember the function of a thing is what it does. So. Uh Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) It's remarkable that, like, Boyd can identify this, like, dialectic engine, right? And he's drawing on, on Marx and, and, like, Marxists, but, like, it's also so evident that, like, historical Marxism had lost any of this kind of dynamism and was nowhere near as dialectical as it thought it was. <laughs> like, uh. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because, like, in the Russian Revolution, what Lenin was trying to do was to do this to Marxism, in, 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 the, evid- in, in the face of, like, the disaster of World War I. But it really didn't, like, he didn't go about it very well, is the problem. No, he actually built the, an even more rigid, constru- like, like we start longing for the for the uncertainty and ambiguousness about the future of the Second International and Karpowski, and I'm like, oh god, that's something's gone horribly wrong if that's our point for flexibility, because they handled World War I so well. <laughs> hmm. So, like, the dialectic engine got one kick and turned over one, one like, cycle, but then just stopped, right? Like, there was, there was one attempt to do this with Marxism, and then just, no, 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 fuck this, we're, we're static from now on. Well, I mean, it seems to happen every time that Marxists are in a... I don't want to sound like a Nicholas Talib, but, like, when Marxists are actually invested in an actual fight and their literal survival is on the line, then, yes, they start actually doing some of this stuff. But as soon as they feel like they've established power, almost cynically, they go back to an internal system. And they, they, I mean, like, if you look at the USSR, you want to talk about something that was so internally, like, so highly teleologically centralized and oriented that it couldn't do anything but increase entropy. Like, I almost think, like, that, that, that factor is something that people don't want to talk about in the USSR because they don't. As much as they want to talk about, you know, immortal science or whatever, they don't want to look at actual science and what it would implicate for that self, that enclosed of a system. Like, yeah, any kind of autarky is going to necessarily collapse. Like, that's what it does in all systems in nature. Well, there's a dreadful irony in that, like, autarky and, like, this kind of, like, strong state, yada, yada, strong leader sort of thing is usually proposed, like, or it's usually justified as... Uh, as it being a good way to survive. Like, oh, this, we, we need a strong leader because it's actually a strong system. This is how we stabilize things, yada, yada. But, like, as we've, we've seen all throughout the run of the show, like, the stuff we've been reading and, like, this stuff here, like, what you end up with there is just an engine that's choking on its own fumes and is destined to collapse. And there's, there's a dreadful irony in, like, something that is fundamentally and structurally unsound being used as a justification for soundness or, like, sound, apparent soundness being used as a justification for it. Um, it's, it, it's no wonder we're fucking swimming in crises constantly, right? Right. Well, I mean, it's interesting because this actually comes up in Tainer. Tainer talks about how there is an innate appeal 
um, and over complex systems because of their anthropic nature to want to appeal to a dictator to come in and just break the systems apart. But with that, yeah, but what that usually does is accelerate decline even further because it also gets rid of, it doesn't, it doesn't just break up and free the energy. It literally destroys like all these things and centralizes it further into one person. And when that person's gone, you don't have anything. You know, because uh, a human body is an anthropic system; it eventually falls apart. So, like, <laughs> sorry, cyber linen. Um, okay, so so when he gets to his uh, his 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 most Hegelian, uh, he says uh, the process of structure, unstructure, restructure, unstructure, restructure is repeated endlessly in moving to higher and broader levels of elaboration. I believe we have uncovered a dialectic engine that permits the construction of decision models needed by an individual and societies for determining monitoring actions in the effort to improve their capacity for independent action. Like, that's like more Hegel than Hegel, you know? Yes. And uh, the this, this point about independent action, capacity for independent action is important for uh, Boyd because we kind of skipped over it, but... He sees it as the fundamental aim of humanity. Like, this is the core of human nature. Is individual liberty. Yes. Individual. Yes, 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 exactly. And not not just abstract, not just abstract liberty, but like literally capacity for independent action. Well, it's a little like the functional and uh, collective autonomy that we saw in the Thomas Swan book, right? It, it, It can be sort of read that way. I don't think that's what... Boyd is doing, but uh, yeah. Well, well, again, like the, the the thing is that he sees this as like the actual fundament of all human behavior, um, right? Whereas he does think that basically all human behavior is a proxy, or actually, literally, is war. Like, yes, uh, he's yeah. I think he's I think he's too liberal to be a Nietzschean, but. He's kind of in that neighborhood ish. His his Hobbesianism also kind of shows up there with like okay, individuals want to maximize their um, their autonomy and therefore they get together in in groups and operate together to do that. It's, it's yeah. a very social contract. It's very social contract angle sort of thing. But I guess like when I was reading this, it was like it's not his some of what he's expressing is not entirely incompatible with like the the functional autonomy stuff. But his angle on it is very different, you know. Oh no, that's true. It, it it's it's the assumption that that is the absolute fundament of human behavior. Whereas, like somebody somebody like Beer would assume that we have a nature that can flourish, and our our fundamental aim is towards flourishing, which is not at all assumed by Boyd. Right, which would not necessarily, like, flir- individual flourishing would not necessarily be de- totally dependent on individual uh, autonomy of movement. Like, um, which is, it's a subtle distinction, actually, but it's kind of a big one. It is, it is, yeah. There's there's sort of, like, more implied in the Aristotelian assumptions than there is in the Boydian ones. Uh, it's, it's also open-ended, right, with the Eudaimonian flourishing stuff. Um that you could you could learn to flourish in different ways that are not foreseen initially, right? It's just like how it's it's like Aristotelian virtue models. If you if you don't assume that Aristotle uh, Aristotle had the precise virtue ratios right, then then you have like infinite virtues and strengths that you can model in infinitely different ways, um, or you can limit it by something arbitrary like Athenian society or uh, Christianity or whatever, but. But the initial impulse is still redeemable from Aristotle. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I think that eudaimonia is also like that, like human flourishing is, is a, is a concept that contains multiple, um, vectors, whereas human autonomy contains one. Mm, Yeah, true. Certainly. Um, basically it's like if there would be nothing, like if let's say Jeff Bezos were able to completely subjugate uh, humanity and just exist in in an autonomous sense on another planet. Um, 
there would be nothing in what he was doing that would be contrary to his nature in a Boydian sense. According, yeah. So basically, Dr. Manhattan would be the ultimate Boydian character. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is, which is where, like, he's kind of a Nietzschean, but also, like, he's, he's, he's really more of a Hobbesian, you know? Yeah. So I think there's something um, good in, like, con- just continuing on the quote there. So, furthermore, since this engine is directed towards satisfying this basic aim or goal, it follows that the goal-seeking effort itself appears to be the other side of a control mechanism that seems also to drive and regulate the alternating cycle of destruction and creation toward higher and broader levels of elaboration. In this context, when acting within a rigid and or essentially a closed system, the goal-seeking effort of individuals and societies to improve their capacity for independent action tends to produce disorder towards randomness and death. On the other hand, as already shown, the increasing disorder generated by the increasing mismatch of the system concept with observed reality opens or unstructures the system. As the unstructuring, or as we call it, the destructive deduction unfolds, it shifts toward a creative induction to stop the trend towards disorder and chaos to satisfy a goal-oriented need for increased order. Paradoxically, then, an entropy increase permits both the destruction or unstructuring of a closed system and the creation of a new system to nullify the march toward randomness and death. So there's a there's this kind of bright light there. There's a, it's, it's that actually... Um, you know, we can we can it, we certainly experience the in, increase in chaos as traumatic, but it, if if we if we think that the system is maybe operating on this higher level, it could be just one leg of a an alternating process that the destructuring and chaos is fertile ground for restructuring and for rejuvenation. But you have to be aware of it, like to to take advantage of it. Yes. And it, it, this is basically like Hegelian reconciliation. Um, like when you have the synthesis, it's like you've gone through this traumatic destabilization, but like actually you re- re- you you get a new conceptual system. So you're able to reframe your experience. Um, but uh, I think that the key things here is that to simply go for Landian accelerationism is just the entropic drive to destruction, right? Right. So, so like, yeah. So either if you're Paul Varillo, who's afraid of that, because I keep on thinking about Land and Varillo when I was reading this, um, uh, Varillo is totally afraid of that, which is like a leftist conservatism where you just become afraid of speed. And then, then there is the Landian accelerationism. That would be just a drive for destruction for its own sake. Like... Like in, in the jouissance of chaos, like, oh, there's all these possible fecundity of life, but ignoring the fact that like, you know, um, even ev- like when I talk about like evolution, I'm always like, remember that evolution is 99.9% anthropic death. Like, <laughs> like uh, and I think the, the other thing there is that like you're sort of getting at this leftist conservatism, Derek. And I think that's the thing that comes up for me a lot is that like when I read Boyd, it seems to be that like a lot of this stuff doesn't appeal on the left because leftist conservatism is the default like dominant ideology on the left. Uh, right, because because leftists don't separate between conservative temperament and then what they think to be the substance of ideologies. And so to constantly see yourself as a victim and to constantly see yourself as stress is actually a conservatizing force. Um and and also to like basically go through the 20th century have the construction of like a lasallian welfare state and then be entirely invested in its preservation and extension um is is a conservative position and to see yourself besieged by chaos on all sides and that like that kind of desperate retrenchment yeah it's, it's extremely conservative Right. I mean, and you see that also in the, like, and this is across the board in the left, like the defenses of, of, uh, Zhidong China, um, is, is effectively, if you like, look at, for example, the quote, red, uh, the red new deal new regulations, it's effectively like celebrating China for doing what the capitalist countries said they might do in the thirties. I mean, like, like, and so like your vanguard of the socialist revolution 
is literally just trying to do what was attempted in the West in in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Like that's that's it. So it, that, how how is that not a conservative position? And that's on the most. And to me, that kind of still is like one of the least conservative parts of it. When you get into like defending FDR as like the the focal point of revolutionary Marxism, or defending the Canadian welfare state, or defending um, even the National Health Service, and, and it's it's just like, but you're not you're not injecting anything new into this. You're just defending a sclerotic system, and it's easy for these neoliberals to take advantage of that, like. Um, it's, it's, it's also like one of the big problems with, uh, like sustainability initiatives where, um, they can only be admitted in so far as they are an extension of the existing system. Like, and that's not simply capitalist market dynamics. It's also the form of bureaucracy that is dominant, uh, in the world right now. Right, it's about to say not not everything is capitalism. Some of these systems problems are more fundamental than that. Mm-hmm. It's it's also like something that I found. It was kind of after the January sixth stuff that this really started to strike me. Right, that like, um, I, I sort of start to wonder if like that kind of left conservatism is just going to be the dominant strand, and that kind of like anti system leftism is just going to be impossible because, like, we 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 live amongst a kind of system that is in continuous collapse and is evidently not fit for purpose for the governance of human life and so on and so forth, right? But if... I, 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 could, see our, I could see politics kind of getting, getting into a place where the only people who are, like, moving against the system are all moving from the right against it, and the left... the, the like, anarcho-Bidenist pact kind of double down on just defending whatever threadbare bullshit is left in the kind of, like, wreckage of the welfare state... Well, this is the rational core of the PMC thesis. Like, and I don't agree with the PMC thesis, but there is a sense in which, because of the chaos and trying to defend these these things, and and but in the United States, I don't even really know what they're defending anymore because we're not getting even the reforms they were promised, and um, every condition that, that that they're concerned about is actually getting worse. But um, there's a def- there's an idea that well, since since our enemies are embracing the chaos of the situation, we have to go in defensive mode against the system. We have to defend Gavin Newsom. We have to defend um, AOC. We have to defend Biden because the alternative is worse. Um, well, I hate to tell you that that is a you're dead. You're dead in the water. It actually it actually. Um, in, in a way that I would take from a Boyd synthesis, it's like it's a Weimar situation where you, you're literally ceding action only to your opposition. They're the only people now capable of action, so they will win. Like... <laughs> um, and if you... Like, we're going to get into this later in the chapter, but Boyd talks about Blitzkrieg and counter-Blitzkrieg, and the successful counter-Blitzkrieg strategy, which is the, the, the strategy the Soviets used once they got their shit together... In, in the Second World War, um, uh, is is not to sit and wait or to defend strong points. It's actually yeah, that's what they were trying to do, and that's what led to the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact. <laughs> yeah, and 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 then the actual successful strategy is to have the better OODA loop than your opponent. You out blitzkrieg the blitzkriegers. To to be better at blitzkrieging, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It literally counter blitz. You know, like you shatter you shatter their coordination before they shatter yours. You know, uh, but that, none of that is evident in the left in like the UK or the US. Not like fucking zero. And like I, yeah, again, like when the January sixth stuff, and I was like, oh my god, they're all just gonna go in on like defending the honor of the fucking Capitol building and like when you had ostensible fucking Marxists ca- calling for the the MAGA dipshits to be executed in front of the fucking Washington Monument or whatever, and it's like, Jesus goddamn Christ, like, they're just gonna go in and defend the existing system as as absolutely fucked as it is. Like, it's it's going to morph into this thing that just defends whatever happens to exist, you know? Right. But they were doing it in the context of literally processing it minutes ago. That's I think that's when I think a lot of people lost. I, I, what people don't realize also is like, um, that's also discrediting. Like for all the people talking about the vitality of, of the of the George Floyd uh, 
in solar actions. And I, I do believe there's real vitality there. I'm not shitting on it. Um, the, uh, the way the left handled the counter response, which was not to, you know, try to outdo, um, which by the way, have been the successful strategy as much as I think, uh, Antifa strategy and Antifa popular frontism has been a large waste of time. Um, the one time it did matter, which was Charlottesville, how was it successful? Well, somebody died, but also they counter mobilized basically doing the same thing as their opponents. Um, and that's not what's been learned from any of this. I, I think this also gets to sort of what we were talking about in the last episode where, um, this is kind of the dead end that the Occupy to electoralism uh, path ran into uh, and like why the social democracies of Europe, like the de social democratic parties of Europe, were so decimated by the 2007-2008 crisis uh, was because like they were stuck in these purely defensive positions and like didn't actually have that uh, uh, capacity for independent action, right? Like they were, they were just moribund uh, in the face of crisis. Mm -hmm. the, the capacity for independent action thing really reminds me of like, um, uh, I think it's a sort of like, I guess, fringe kind of like theory for like what exactly constitutes intelligence. Um, and it's the, the notion that, like, intelligence basically correlates to causal entropy. I think it's a sort of weird bullshit word the folks made up for it. But basically that, like, an intelligence system will try to maximize or optimize the number of possible actions it has in its future. Um, so, like, it'll... You find a high point from which to, to look because you have the, you know, largest number of possible egresses and that kind of stuff, right? And that's... And I think that kind of correlates with the capacity for independent action, right? That, like, an intelligent self-organizing system will optimize itself to have a wide array of options available to itself and to have all of those options be actually good. And again, no, none of that I see in in the contemporary left, like the fucking DSA momentum. None of these fucking people exhibit any of that kind of stuff. Like, it, it would be hard to classify it as having independent action, having intelligence, having strategy, having organization, having any of this stuff we've been we've been talking about. Yeah, I think the, the the counterpoint there is the the point about variety attenuation that like you don't actually want to maximize, but you want to find yeah you want to optimize it in terms of what you can actually handle. Uh, but you know yeah, just going back to that point about electoralism, it's like you had say like the French uh, social democrats or the Germans or what or the, the the Greeks or whatever, and. Like, you know, people rightly analyzed the situation, what was happening after the crisis, and were saying, well, you're not living up to the ideals and goals that you are supposed to stand by. We're going to put somebody else in power who can or who is willing to actually enact our ideals. Um, and so then you have like, you know, that kind of like uh, movement of the squares and all that kind of stuff that happens, right? And, and it gets channeled into electoralism. And then once it's into the electoral system, it's the same dead end. The, pro the problem space hasn't really changed at all. In fact, if anything, what you've done is actually in inculcated your enemy um, uh, with more energy, which is I've been kind of like trying to, to get when I say stuff like, you know, the, the left has functionally saved the center in the United States. It's because actually you have you have propelled the movement of momentum because you only respond to counterforce. You're literally only in a reactionary mode in the in the strict sense of that. Not in the I'm not saying that in the substantive ideological sense, but in the you are reacting. That's all you're doing. Well, like, yeah, absolutely. Like if you look at the um, the whole thing from if you look at the whole, say, DSA versus Democrats sort of thing, but look at it from the Democrats angle like the D the dnc angle like that's a fairly well-tuned machine that then digests the dsa and uses that as a source of new energy and new information and uses that to revive itself in in a kind of boydian way you know you know 
right? The dirty split strategy and all this in this weird Bordian way would, would actually only work if you use it to disrupt the Democrats. But that's the exact thing that they don't want to do because they feel like they're in the, the, a defensive mechanism to save the gains of the Democrats. And, and, and structurally speaking, and I've been telling people to study game theory for this for a long time, that's a losing game. There's no way to win that game. Well, it's a, it's a winning game from the DNC's perspective because they can use the DSA and that kind of stuff as a, as a food source, essentially. Like, it's a counter-entropy pump, you know? Right, it's a new way to get, to get uh, activists invested into the, into the DNC, to, to screen for talent from outside of traditional DNC sources. Um, but it also, and, and it, it actually is a controlled opposition. Like, it, in the quite literal sense. Like, and and um, I think the the thing that always pisses me off around election time is that people are extremely uh, energized to push everyone around them into activism for whatever left party is in power or has a prospect of being in power, whatever you know, whatever the lesser evil is of the day. Um, and the thing that I, I don't people at least think of in the same way that I do is that like you're actually expending energy and increasing your entropy in order to make that happen. Like this isn't free. It, like that's why I get so angry at social Democrats or Democrats in the U.S. who – lecture activists about how like like as though this is free because it's free for them <laughs> but it's not free for us <laughs> i kind of just want motherfuckers to think about cost even if even if just in brute like caloric terms like like if you spend your day going canvassing for the democrats you can't spend the same day doing something else it's really basic kind of shit yeah yeah it's an opportunity cost loss like yeah like like when i work for the ndp here uh campaigning and they were running a disastrous campaign and they got absolutely hammered and then proceeded to learn absolutely nothing from that that felt like a really fundamental violation of my trust because i put the energy into campaigning doing things like avoiding things that I could otherwise be doing for that party. And they just take that as gratis and carry on in the same disastrous direction. It's like, well, that's not a two way street in any way. And like, I cannot come away from that and have any self-respect if I'm just going to do the same thing again. They're using you as a food source. You're, you're chewing their food for them. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> like what? Come on. Which, 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 which is funny because when I talk about this in regards to like the DSA and why I won't join, um, and I'm like, because as long as you have an unclear stance on your uh, relationship to the Democrats, you're always going to actually be serving them. And I, as a side note, the, I got I, that was done to me once. I wasted a whole lot of time for both uh, Mike Gravel and then Barack Obama. Um, I don't make the same mistake twice. Like, yeah. You learn from you learn from your mistakes. It's, it's it's that's like that's all I I expect to do for myself and other people to do. But everybody around me, like not everybody, but many people around me, look at me like I'm crazy because I had a bad experience and I'm trying to learn from it. I totally understand your, what you're saying there. Like, is it's it's like I don't know. It's it's really fucking weird because like I. Like, if, if an organism isn't going to learn from its past experiences and, like, integrate new behavior, what the fuck is it doing? But then... It's dying, is what it's doing. Apparently I'm, the, apparently I'm the crazy one for thinking that. And apparently the three of us are crazy for thinking that. Are we totally fucking alone in thinking this? I... you know? No, but... but weirdly, I hate to say this, it's actually, like, centrists talk about this stuff more than we do. Like, if you listen to, like, like uh, Vox or even, like, Heterodox Academy or whatever, they talk about these psychological and anthropic principles and stuff way more than we do. We talk about ideological principles and mystifications. Part of that, I think, is that 
if we are honest, um, we have a conservative position because a lot of people involved in our uh, their orientation is actually trying to replicate a standard of life that they were promised under capitalism through some kind of socialist means. That's why they focus on things like free university, healthcare, which I'm not against. The healthcare thing I can totally defend, but like, um, because that does affect everybody. But but free university, and, and they don't even look at this, that they would have trade-offs in either... Uh, what, what happens in normal cases with free university, and we have this in plenty of countries to study from, right, is you have elite capture of then a free resources, not because it's free, but because it's prestigious, because it's elite and scarce, because they can because the state only invests so much into it. And if the state invests a lot into it, the commodity produced, i.e. the credentialization, becomes not useful, which is what we already see with high school everywhere on earth. Um, so it's like... These, th this, this is not a dynamic way of viewing the world because it's also not taking in these these new changes, new factors, or even basic principles. It's off. It's operating off of static axioms. Yeah, and to rhyme with something I think you said just a moment ago, like it's it, it's a quite quite a dis it's a disappointing realization to realize that for a lot of ostensible communists, like re they really don't have any intention of bringing about a stateless, classless society. It's all really just a backstop for the fact that the economy didn't deliver on the stuff they were promised when they were growing up, you know? And so well, if, if, if my job isn't going to give me, or, or you know, if, if my economic situation isn't going to give me education and entertainment well, or, or whatever and housing, well, I'm going to, we're just going to backstop to something that would. And it's like, it, but that's, it's a defensive, conservative kind of retreat, not like an active thrust toward achieving the thing that you want. There's a real fundamental mix-up at the heart of so much of this. And unfortunately, reading cybernetic theory, even reading conflict theory, I mean, you have to take... Uh, one thing I tell people is you have, if you believe that society is class conflict, you have to take war theory pretty seriously. Otherwise, you're just like, you know, it, it is really... It's it's not even LARPing. It's massive online RPG. Like, like our, LARPing would imply actual tactical experience and action that could be learned from it. But that would go, I'd have to go outside. I'm not going to fucking do that. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and when you read something like this, I mean, it's easy to get mad, mad at the left, um, but it, it really does seem like a fundamental failure of, of like, basic understanding of, of, like, energy dynamics and basic social networks and, you know, like, just a refusal to engage. It's, like, not just a refusal to engage with the political essence of the 20th century. It's, like, a refusal to engage with the science of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Like... I like... I. I think a couple of months ago, maybe a year ago, I posted what what I at the time thought was a troll comment in the Emancipation Discord, saying that most left, almost all like socialists would be better off reading about statistical mechanics rather than Lenin. And I, in reflect, on, in retrospect, I, that really wasn't a troll in, at all in the slightest. You should read, you should read about thermodynamics before you touch any of that other shit. <laughs> you know, you should know basic statistics and basic math before you deal with Lenin. I'm not saying not deal with Lenin, but you got to be able to judge it against something other than its own assertion. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, closed system, right? Closed system of thought, like self-referential uh, entropy spiral. Um, well, I think I think next time we're going to get into this a lot more because we'll be getting into like a lot of Boyd's um, sort of thinking about strategy, thinking about structure, thinking about strategic prescriptions, thinking about what's necessary to win conflicts. Um, and uh, we will see the many ways in which this uh, applies to our current situation. <laughs> uh, but uh, maybe, maybe I'll just read the final uh, block quote here uh, and we'll wrap it up. Uh, so... Uh, Boyd writes, taken together, the entropy notion associated with the second law of thermodynamics and the basic goal of individuals and societies seem to work in dialectical harmony, driving and regulating the destructive creative or deductive inductive action that we have described herein as a dialectic engine. The result is a changing and expanding universe of mental concepts match it, uh, matched to a changing and expanding universe of observed reality. 
As indicated earlier, these mental concepts are employed as decision models by individuals and societies for determining and monitoring actions needed to cope with their environment or to improve their capacity for independent action. And so that's Boyd's explanation of how we get the uh, Orient phase of the OODA loop um, right there. Fun. Um, yeah, it's this, this has been a really incredible read, and I'm looking forward to getting to the next part of the chapter um, in our next next session, because we've, we've been recording for a while. Um, Derek, thanks for coming along with this. This, this is a really incredible discussion. Um, do you have anything uh, you'd like to plug, anything you'd like to tell people about before we go? Yeah, um, first off, read more systems theory. Um, uh, I would actually suggest people read the depressing but not as hopeless book as it sounds, uh, the rise and the collapse of complex civilization by Joseph Tainer from 1988. Um, cause it's an archeologist take on this. Um, uh, and it's been very much picked up by people who study ecology. Um, you can check out Varm blog where I'm increasingly talking about this stuff as, uh, the turn away from me complaining about why the DSA sucks, um, to like, well, let's talk about the deeper reason why and what you could possibly do about it. Um, uh, and uh, check out Mortal Science, where we talk about why uh, leftism has failed to live up to its promise to be anything like even approaching a science, um, which is, you know, the, the, the whole purpose of that podcast. Um, and uh, yeah, um, that would be where to find me. Um, I do warn people, though, it's not introductory material. It is not a communist 101 podcast. <laughs> Thank you for listening to General Intellect Unit. Until next time, you can catch us on Twitter at GIUnitPod, and you can find us on the web at GeneralIntellectUnit.net. If you go to patreon.com slash GeneralIntellectUnit and throw us a couple of bucks a month, you can help us to keep the lights on and get access to our community Discord. This show is part of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast network and research collective. Go to emancipation.network and check out our sister shows such as From Alpha to Omega, Swamp Site Chats, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Varen Vlog. They are all excellent shows and excellent folks. Once again, thanks for listening, and we hope you enjoyed the show. 